And I'm going to be talking about biotechnology, which is a big part of my life, right? And what I'm here to do is try to encourage you to make it part of your lives. And I'll tell you why at the end. But I'll show you some of the things that I've done and some of the things that I think biotechnology is really cool and a really exciting place to spend your future years. So let me start with what I think we'll get out of this presentation. I'm going to explain how we got to 8 billion humans on this planet. How we increased human lifespan from 30 years to 80 years in the last 150 years. Okay? I'm going to have to try to explain what the difference is between biotechnology and chemical or pharmaceutical medicines. There's two big types of medicines in the world. There's chemistry and there's biology. I'll explain the difference to them. Um, Boston is the center of the biotech universe. You probably know that already. If you don't, you now know now. Okay? It's the center of the biotech universe. So if there's any, if you're remotely interested in this, this is the place to be. Um, and I'll talk a bit about what it takes to succeed in a career in biotech. Okay? Um, now, some of this stuff is pretty complicated, um, and I tend to speak quickly. So please shut me up. I, I, if you've got a question, somebody else has got a question too, right? They've got that same question, so please interrupt me. Um, I'm here for you to teach you, to help you to understand what's going on here. So, um, so interrupt me um, if I don't make sense. Uh, a bit of background, I've got a degree in physics. I'm a Brit, if you can't tell from my accent. Right? Uh, I, my first job out of college was in marketing at Unilever. Unilever is like the European equivalent of Procter & Gamble. to make soaps and detergents, dishwasher, liquids and that kind of stuff. Um, but I came here to go to uh, Harvard Business School, met this girl, fell in love, she's now my wife, mother of my three children. Anyone know any, any of our children? I know you do, right? And you do, right? Anyone else know Sally Jack or Laura? Yeah, okay. a couple, a couple of yours. Um, there's about three kids, they've all been educated here. Um, after HTS, I went to uh, a strategy consultant company, I worked in Cambridge, Maths, and Johannesburg, South Africa. In my return, <coughs> we got married, <coughs> um, started this company called Harvard Bioscience. Uh, which actually traces its roots back to Harvard Medical School in 1901. Uh, Harvard Apple was the original university to spin out. Like many people think it was Hewlett Packard. Mr. Hewlett Mr. Packard started in the garage in Silicon Valley. It was not. That was 1954. This is 1901 uh, when Harvard Apple was spun off from Harvard University. Uh, HBO is the ticket symbol on NASDAQ. Took it public in 2000, grew up from 10 million to 100 million. And then BioSage, the company I just left, um, began as a subsidiary of Harvard Bioscience. One of the tools that we were making became very useful in this field called stem cells, became, became known as regenerative medicine, which I'll talk more about in a minute. It was spun off as a separate company in 2013. I did the initial public offering in 2015. I had a really nasty road accident in summer of, 20, summer of 2014, nearly killed me. Um, so I went home to, uh, to recover. So I left BioSage, um, and that's when I did the zero carbon stuff, something you're familiar with. And uh, I was asked back to, to, uh, to run the company again back in 2021, just about a year ago. And I left literally two weeks ago. So, um, so there's like a whole journey here uh, in biotech, but I'll tell you about what we did. Uh, let's go back to the beginning though. So imagine we're on the Serengeti Plains in Africa about 200,000 years ago. Humans sort of exist, they don't really exist back then. And that gazelle would have been a human being, right? We were prey. And this was the predator. And back in those times, it was predation, the predators who killed us, it was starvation, we didn't have food, and it was cold. But we killed all the predators, good or bad, we domesticated chickens and plants and wheat and corn and everything, and we made clothes from the skins and the fibers to keep us warm. And this increased the human population from about 4 million 12,000 years ago to about 190 million at the time of Christ. So it's a, that's an enormous increase in human population because of these actions we took to um, kill off the predators, to um, make food, to grow more food, and to um, uh, make clothes. But the average lifespan was the same. So lots more people, but they all still died about 30 years old. So no increase in human lifespan, despite this massive increase in the human population and our success with predators and making clothes and making food. So this is the human population. That, that here I just talked about is from here, 4 million in 10,000 BCE to 190 million with the birth of Christ, okay? That's actually an exponential curve, right? The exponential curve is 0.04% per year. Now what that means is if you were in a tribe of 100 people, and that was sort of roughly the size of tribes, then there'd be one, there'd be 101 person by the time you die. That's what 0.04% per year means. You go from 100 to 101 every 30 years, something like that. 
the really imperceptible growth in the human population until here. Roughly about 1700, something dramatic changes. What was it? Stick your hand up. The Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution, right. What else? The, the, you're right, there's and. So there's, there's other things as well, yeah. Agricultural Revolution. Agricultural Revolution, yep. In part fueled by the Industrial Revolution. Yep. Did you have a comment? No. Yeah, at the back. Medicine. Modern medicine, yep. Anything else? There's one other big thing you're missing. So yes, it was medicine. Yes, it was the Industrial Revolution driving agriculture. There was something else as well that was very important. It was really simple. It actually began with hand washing. I'm not joking, I'm not making this up, but sanitation in general. The separation of drinking water from sewer pipes made cities livable, but previously they were infested with dysentery, cholera, typhoid, tetanus, measles, mumps, rubella, everything. So several things happened here. The Industrial Revolution, the Medical Revolution, and the Sanitary Revolution all happened at about the same time, and there's this massive increase in the human population. So the first part was that, uh, uh, that mechanization of agriculture, there's two things at the same time. This is Jethro Tull's seed drill. Really simple, all it did was <laughs> the seed up here, and drop it out the bottom into a, a reel cut by a, by a wheel. It's like, not very complicated. That revolutionized agricultural production. Because now one person could seed a whole field rather than just doing it, you know, finger by finger planting, planting holes. This is, this is a revolution in agriculture. And then we had steam tractors, seed drills, crop rotation was also part of it. Greatly increased agricultural production, fed a lot more people. Uh, they fed about a billion humans, but they still died at 30 years old. So throughout this massive increase in the domestication of animals, massive increase in population driven by agricultural revolution, we did not increase human lifespan. Thomas Hobbes, a famous 19th century, uh, sorry, 18th century philosopher, stated that in 1790, this is after American independence. So this is, this is fairly recent history, 1790. Life was nasty, brutish, and short. But something happened. Right around here, this average human lifespan, 35 years, and I could take this all the way back to 200,000 years ago on the Serengeti Plains, right? It's been 35 years forever until, wow, something happens. Something happens here, and it's gone up every year until COVID. Right, this is COVID right here. But other than that, it's every year. Now, what do you think? Do you think this might carry on? I, mean, I don't know, but... It's a pretty good trend to me, right? I, mean, I think it's unlikely it's going to keep falling. I think it's likely it's going to carry on. Um, so like your grandchildren might be looking at 150 years of lifespan. Remember, if you had to ask people in 1850, you said, hey, I think your grandchildren will live to be 75 years old. Who would have laughed at you? An insane concept back then, but maybe we can get there if we keep going. Um, in the next uh, two generations. So, uh, the Industrial Revolution did provide far more food, but people still died young. What they die of? Infectious diseases, right? We think of COVID, COVID is an example of an infectious disease, but COVID doesn't actually kill that many people. I know we had, you know, I don't know, a million or so died in America, but compared to smallpox, compared to flu, like the Spanish flu, uh, Asian flu, compared to bubonic plague, these things decimated the population. The Black Death killed a third of everyone in Europe. One out of three in the 1300s. Um, smallpox changed civilization. In 165 AD, um, smallpox killed seven million people and, and caused, okay, I'll put that in inverted commas, caused the fall of the Roman Empire. No one really knows this day why the Roman Empire fell. It's, a, it's been a topic that scholars have discussed forever. But one of the reasons was smallpox changed the Roman Empire. Europeans carried smallpox to the Americas. Native Americans had no immunity against it, wiped out 90% of the Native American population. That's between 50 and 100 million people dead. So COVID is a rounding error in comparison to this. Smallpox and bubonic plague killed enormous numbers of people. The bubonic plague killed so many people, it created both wage labor and the middle class. Wage labor because there were so, there were so few people left, landlords had to people to work on their farms. Before this, they just 
basically imprisoned them on farms and made them work under indentured servitude um, to, uh, to, to grow crops for them. But, but the bubonic plague killed so many, wage labor was introduced. Landlords had to pay people to work, a novel idea back in, uh, back in the 1300s. Uh, and occasionally, um, a man would survive this, but his father would be dead, his grandfather would be dead, and his uncle would be dead. So he inherited three properties. Well, now you had someone who had, had, had capital who wasn't the landlord. Okay, so you had a middle class. You had a middle class of people who were between the landlords and the peasants who could actually afford to say, sell off one of those farmhouses and buy a flock of sheep or to buy a, um, a mill to, to grind the, the wheat into, into flour. Uh, so if anyone's sensitive, please have a look at this. It's a really gruesome picture of, of somebody with smallpox. Um, so please look away if you're, if you're sensitive. But let's show you this quickly. This is what someone looks like when they've got smallpox. Um, so smallpox not only disfigured and killed so many people, it changed the planet. Okay, so, so we're talking about the medical, sanitary, industrial revolution, okay? The industrial revolution is going down quite well. The medical bit, 1797, Edward Jenner, this is him, vaccinates his child. This is the beginning of vaccination. Uh, now what he noticed, that it was common, commonly noticed, was that milkmaids did not get smallpox. When there was a smallpox outbreak, the milkmaids would survive. Why? Because the milkmaids were touching the cows all the time, and they got a disease called cowpox, which is why this cow is looking at the window of this picture here, because the milkmaids got this disease called cowpox, which is very mild in humans. It's, it's um, a killer for cows, but it's very mild in humans, but it gave them immunity against smallpox. And he deliberately gave his child a cowpox in, uh, infection, and the kid then survived when smallpox came around with the next wave. This is the beginning of vaccination and a revolution in the lifespan of the human lifespan. Doctors started washing their hands, and that sounds trivial, but, most, but doctors would literally go from the basement, where they'd be operating on cadavers, dead humans, to do physiology, then they'd go up and, and, uh, and help a woman give birth. Maternal mortality was 18% in those days until doctors started washing their hands. This was the revolution of, of sanitation, of understanding that cleanliness matters, it was that germs being carried from one person to another were part of why infections were so rampant. Uh, so, so vaccines were invented in 1787 by, by less than actually 50 years later, vaccines became mandatory by law in Britain and the USA. So there's two things going on here. There's a public health component, where this becomes the law, you have to be vaccinated, and there's a scientific breakthrough. Only 50 years apart, very short space of time, before everyone in Britain, everyone in the USA was being vaccinated against smallpox. This led to dramatic reductions in, in human deaths and great increase in lifespan. 1850s were about when water pipes and sewers became separated, so clean water was not contaminated with sewage water. This dramatically reduced cholera, typhoid, dysentery, and dozens of other diseases as well. 1899, Bayer. Who, who, who's ever bought Bayer aspirin? You, you've seen it, seen it on the shelves in CPS, right? So the reason it's called Bayer aspirin is that Mr. Bayer, Herr Bayer, the German guy, Herr Bayer invented it in uh, 1899. He was the first person ever to synthesize a medicine. Synthesize means making a lab rather than collect from nature. Uh, so he was a chemist who began this uh, era of medicine, chemical medicine, okay? Uh, so, so Jenner had now developed a way to prevent infection. Uh, Bayer had developed a way to at least alleviate the symptoms of infection. And then Fleming, Alexander Fleming, discovered penicillin which stops infection. The first antibiotic that stops infection. We've now got three mechanisms of dealing with uh, infectious diseases in a short space of time, only about 60, 70 years. Um, so this led to a 50 year increase in the lifespan, now 80 years for human beings in the West, um, and an eight fold increase in the human population uh, just in the last 150 years. So this is due to the triple revolution of medicine, sanitation, and industrialization. It wasn't just survival. This is called the Gini coefficient, which measures the inequality between the people who live longest and the people who live, live shortest within a given population. And back then in the 1700s, basically this means there was the, the, uh, the poor people live very short lives, the rich people live much longer lives. But today, we all live about the same length of time. There's still some difference, it's not zero, but uh, the amount has reduced significantly. So this science-based revolution in medicine has been as important at reducing inequality as it has at increasing lifespan and increasing um, increasing number of people on the planet.
Um, so we talk about um, aspirin. Aspirin is, is basically this, this little shaped molecule here, it's roughly the same size as aspirin. It's a very small 500 molecular weight or thereabouts uh, molecule. This big purple thing is a protein. Proteins are very large molecules in your body. Um, so other than that green thing, who can spot the difference between those two purple molecules? Okay, can you point to something? Well, you can't really. Right, this lump here, it's moved. Right? It's moved back. This little lump here, it's sunk in. Now, proteins function the body by their shape. So when the shape changes, the function changes. And that means that perhaps protein that was doing something good in the body is now doing something bad in the body. In fact, probably the way around. This protein is probably doing something bad in the body, causing a disease, like the spike protein on COVID. You heard about that during the COVID, COVID uh, period. Um, this changes the function of the protein by changing its shape, okay? And that's what a small molecule does to a big molecule. That's why medicines work. This is how a medicine like aspirin works. This is how a medicine like um, like a, a, a anti-cholesterol medicine works or a high blood pressure medicine works. Do it by changing the shape of the protein. Uh, until 1970, all medicines were chemistry. They were all small molecules like aspirin. Um, but in the 1970s, scientists started to discover how to manipulate proteins, and this became biotechnology. The manipulation of large molecules in the body, the proteins in the body, and the DNA that creates them, rather than the small molecules, which are chemistry, okay? And this really added a second uh, armamentarium to the chemistry, to, to, the, to, the, to the chemicals. Now, have chemicals and, and biology at the same time, all being used for human health. This is the first uh, biotech medicine. In 1972, recombinant DNA was invented. This means taking a gene, from, which is a piece of DNA, from one organism and putting it into another organism, okay? The gene here was the gene that makes human insulin. Insulin is part of your, your blood system, which allows the sugar which you eat to go into your cells where it can be used. Without insulin, you can't get the sugar into the cells and eventually you die, okay? Uh, that's called diabetes. Um, and uh, so the way diabetics are treated is they inject insulin to replace the insulin that's not being made by their body. Insulin is one of those very big protein molecules. Uh, and uh, so that was discovered in the 1970s. By 1982, about 10 years later, the FDA, that's the part of the government that regulates medicines, approved human, human insulin producing diabetes, produced using recombinant DNA, which is genetically engineered DNA that takes the human gene for human insulin and puts it into a bacteria and then cooks up large numbers of bacteria in a big vat, siphons off the uh, insulin, puts it in a bottle, and a doctor can inject it to uh, re replace the insulin lost by the body. Uh, notice this is in a bottle. It's not a pill, it's a liquid. What would happen if you ate this, if you swallowed this? You digest it, so the molecules make that, and that would really Spot on, spot on. It's a protein. It's like eating meat. Your, your digestive system is intended to digest protein. So if you ate this, like with eating aspirin, you, you would just, it would be useless. Your body would digest it, it would be broken up into amino acids and it would not function. So you have to inject it into the bloodstream. So most biotech drugs, most large molecule drugs are injectables. They're used as syringe to inject into the arm. They don't, they don't get eaten the way pills do because they just be digested by the body. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so that was the first hum human medicine using biotech. The second, not the second one, but the second big breakthrough was using gene therapy, which is actually replacing a faulty gene. Sometimes people are born with faulty genes. Um, there is, there's a type one diabetes actually where people are born with the faulty gene for making insulin. Uh, in 1990, FDA approved the first gene therapy to replace a faulty gene in a four-year-old girl suffering from this, uh, this disorder called adenosine deaminase deficiency. 1988, an antibody, which is another type of protein, a small type of protein, the antibody uh, was developed that inhibits the HER2 gene, which is used to treat breast cancer. So three different technologies in a fairly short space of time, all leading to new ways to treat human patients. Uh, the FDA approves all medicines in the United States. You can't uh, use a medicine without having FDA approval. And over time, you see the number of uh, uh, chemical medicines actually stayed about the same. The number of biotech medicines has increased. Now it's roughly 50-50. Uh, all the biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies are producing uh, biotech drugs as often as they're producing um, uh, chemical medicines.
So I'm just continuing that timeline now. We started with the chemical medicines, we then went to the biological medicines, the proteins, the gene therapy, the antibodies. Continuing this, in 2001, the FDA approved Dermograph. This is Dermograph. Uh, this is for, um, for treating skin burns. You don't burn, you can replace the skin with the, the Dermograph. This is basically just cells. Allogeneic is a fancy scientific term that means cells from someone else, okay? So these are not cells from a patient, these are cells from someone else. They were, the cells were banked, they were expanded. They're grown into this, um, it's just like a slab of jello. Like it's literally like, it's so soft, you can easily tear it with your fingers. You have to very carefully apply it to the skin. Um, and uh, that has, it's really just, just the cell. Cells naturally secrete a, like a glue that sticks them together. So, uh, but the, the consistency of this is like jello. That was used, the first um, cell-based product to treat the human diseases, to treat burnt skin. Um, then the first use of autologous, autologous means cells from the patient put back into the patient, okay? Um, uh, to treat the human trachea in 2008, 2016, uh, uh, Macy, this is Macy, was approved in knee cartilage repair, so people who've like, worn out their knees, which happens a lot, so most a lot of people my age who are athletes of your age, uh, their knees are starting to go at this point, or their hips are starting to go, and uh, a lot of people use this. So this, is, this has a matrix, so this has, has only cells, this has cells on a matrix, on a um, piece of bioresorbable fiber, and the bioresorbable means your body actually digests it. So not to lose it, it metabolizes, it absorbs it. So this is temporary, it's a temporary scaffold, so the knee is actually taken apart, um, this uh, uh, sheet is put in, the knee is stitched back together again, the fabric eventually just dissolves away, and it leaves the cells which regenerate the cartilage. That was approved in um, uh, 2016, and that was the first autologous, meaning it's from the patient to the patient, um, use of cells to treat a human disease. 2017, the first use of human cells to regenerate the human esophagus, that was done by my company. The company I just left. 2019, CRISPR technology invented at MIT is edits genes. So we, we, saw, we talk, talked firstly about cutting genes out of humans and putting them into bacteria. That made a replacement protein. This allows us to edit the genes and to change the sequence in a gene and correct where it's uh, inaccurate. 2022, the FDA approved Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine, which many of you have taken. Uh, I took uh, five doses of Moderna's vaccine. This is an antibody, a small specialized type of protein. This is produced from mRNA. mRNA is the translator between the DNA and the proteins, okay? So either you can fix the genes, or you can replace the genes, fix the genes with CRISPR. You can um, uh, uh, intervene at the mRNA level, or you can replace the entire protein. Um, and uh, the regenerated human esophagus, uh, this is uh, from, from my company, uh, will enter clinical trials next month. So, so I'm going to pass this around. This is um, this is what we make. It's a fibrous scaffold. This is um, permanent but retrievable. So the surgeon will cut open the chest of the patient, take out the disease part of the esophagus, throw it away. This is cellularized with the patient's own cells. So before the surgery, a small part of your fat tissue from your, your waist is taken. The cells are expanded, seated on the scaffold, is implanted back in. This encourages the body to regrow the esophagus. And then this actually does not become incorporated in the tissue, this is removed by the mouth. So there's, so there's no permanent implant, this is just a temporary cell scaffold. If I pass this around, you can take a look at it. Um, and that will enter clinical trials next month. Uh, so let me just show you how this works, if I can. Patients with a diseased esophagus caused by conditions including Barrett esophagus or esophageal cancer can be treated with an esophagectomy, a surgical procedure that removes some or most of the esophagus. At the end of the esophagectomy, the esophagus can be reconstructed by either reshaping the stomach and connecting it to the free end of the digestive tract, or by removing a portion of the intestine and relocating it to where the esophagus was removed. The current surgical procedure has a 90-day mortality rate as high as 19%. Life-threatening complications can occur following a standard esophagectomy. Major pulmonary complications can develop in more than one out of three patients. Leaks occurring at the junction of the reconstructed esophagus arise in up to 30% of the patients and can lead to infection and sepsis. With their pioneering cell frame technology, the patient's native esophagus can be regenerated. Two weeks before an esophagectomy, 
Stem cells are retrieved from the patient's abdominal adipose tissue. The stem cells are isolated and expanded. Then, inside a bioreactor, a porous cell span implant is incubated with the stem cells. The cells adhere to and interact with the implant. At the end of the esophagectomy, the cell span implant seated with stem cells is then implanted to reconstruct the patient's own esophagus. Preclinical studies showed that the stem cell seated cell span implant possesses all of the necessary cues to start and guide the regeneration of a layered biological structure. This includes all the specialized cell types of the native esophagus with significant regeneration of the muscle components. A striking feature of the cell span esophageal implant is that the implant is not permanent. Our implant is actually retrieved by the mouth. There is no need for further surgical procedure. All that is there is the new esophagus that has been grown thanks to the cell span by esophageal implant. Um, so let's hear it from doctors, what they think there about this. There can be many other indications in children and adults. So it's one thing to build one of something. It's another thing to build 10, and then it's another thing to build 1,000. So there are many different applications, and this would be a fundamental breakthrough for the field of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. There are many patients that could have a replacement that would either save their lives or help their lives enormously, first in esophagus, but then in other tubes of the body. For example, the airways of the lung are tubes, they're living tubes, and the cell span technology can be adapted for replacement of those structures that are either congenitally malformed or uh, affected by diseases such as tumors. But other tubes of the body include the intestine, there are many diseases where there is not sufficient intestine, either in children or adults, and this might be a perfectly suited um, technology that can be adapted for that use. Cell span implant is revolutionary and will offer a novel treatment approach. So the goal for our team is to really get this to market as quickly as possible because it will change many children's lives. I think of numerous children over the last several years, at least five off the top of my head that would have benefited from this therapy that have gone on to have routine standard of care surgical therapy and have been in the hospital for prolonged periods of time and uh, suffered from that, whereas I think this implant would have totally negated some of those complications. This is very exciting because this will definitely impact the way we deliver care to babies. Okay, let's talk about careers in biotech. Hopefully I've given you a sense this is cool stuff and you perhaps ought to be interested in it. It's very exciting to work in this field. I had a great time in the last 20 years, okay? And I think there are other people here talking about biotech that I'm sure they'll say the same thing to you. So um, this is the center of the life science universe, right? Biotech universe, Boston, Cambridge. This is where to be, you are here already. We have the greatest concentration of top universities, the greatest concentration of top hospitals, Trustees, research institutes, specialist colleges, there's over a thousand biotech companies in Massachusetts. We have, we have 114 universities. Can you believe that? I was staggered when I went to the research on that. We have 114 universities. We've got a university on every street corner in Massachusetts. Um, and a thousand biotech companies. And you may not recognize these names, but Biogen is very well known. Moderna developed the, the, the mRNA vaccine, Bluebird Millennium. The list just goes on and on and on. The state government supports it, the federal government supports it, um, plus all the old chemical companies, the chemical uh, the chemical pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer, Merck, Novartis, Bristol, Myers, Squibb, they all have research uh, locations here as well, most of them in Cambridge. Um, and much of the life science tools industry, which is the equipment used by the researchers to do the experiments, is here too. Um, some of which is the biggest one, Waters, Burke and Elmer, Charles Rilla Lab, and um, Carl Biosciences, which I founded. Uh, are all in this uh, in this neighborhood as well. So this is uh, uh, the center of the universe for, for biotech. Uh, if you want to be on a career in biotech, um, if it's early stage, you're really going to have to have a deep science background. Uh, a BS will kind of get you in, but to be in a leadership role, you need an MD 
or a PhD or an MBA, there are quite a lot of people who have two, two out of three. There are MD PhDs, there are MD MBAs, there are PhD MBAs, and there are some who have all three. Now, if you take all three degrees, you're not going to be working until you're about 30, okay? Because these degrees take a long time. Um, but I, I know two people, both in both my field, have a PhD, an MD, and an MBA. Okay, so there's a very, very uh, high level of education needed to, to do well at the leadership level in these companies. But all these companies need software, manufacturing, finance, accounting, all the normal business functions as well. Uh, but to be in a leadership role, you really need a very strong background in, in chemistry, in biology, or in, um, or in medicine. That's for early stage, we mostly focused on uh, invention and discovery. Uh, later stage, we get to commercial stage, where you're selling the product. They need a lot of other people too, just finance, accounting, sales, marketing, manufacturing. Uh, most of these people will still have some technical background. Um, even the people in finance, accounting, sales, and marketing. It's a, if you're selling pharmaceuticals to uh, doctors or to hospitals, obviously you've got to understand the chemistry and the biology behind it. So, so even people in sales and marketing tend to have uh, a lot of uh, degrees. Uh, biotech is very fun and very rewarding. I've really enjoyed my time in biotech. Uh, I'm not done, by the way. Although I left as CEO, I'm still on the board of the company. Uh, uh, you're, you're helping other people. This is probably the greatest buzz of all of this. You're helping people in horrible conditions. Uh, you're doing novel stuff. This is not, not sort of ever been done before. It's novel, interesting stuff. And you're working with very smart, very dedicated people. So that combination, I think, makes it a very uh, uh, exciting and rewarding place to uh, spend your days. Uh, it is more volatile than other industries. Uh, companies go bankrupt. Uh, companies get merged or acquired by bigger companies. This particularly happens with small biotech companies. So, um, so job security really depends on having the, um, the background. Uh, you're not going to get job security with one company. You're going to be moving around from company to company because companies, sometimes they fail. I mean, sometimes, sometimes this stuff gets into clinical trials and it doesn't work. And the company really has no future and uh, most of you will get laid off and have to find other jobs. If you get in early, you can make big money out of this uh, because if, uh, 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 for our, our product, for instance, that, uh, that scaffold uh, seated with the patient cells, the day that BioSage gets FDA approval, which I think it will, we're only just being, beginning this clinical trial, the company's probably worth a billion dollars. So there's a lot of money to be made if you get in early, you get some equity position in the company. Uh, and it does take 10 to 20 years. So BioSage is 15 years old, and we're just starting the clinical trial. It's another five years before we get FDA approval, assuming it works, which I think it will. I can go into if you're interested. I think it will, but I'm saying it's a, it's a long game. This is not like um, gaming or apps or something where you, you might get a very instant um, gratification and instant um, uh, reward. So it's a very long process, um, but when it works, it's, um, it's, it's kind of magic. Uh, let me uh, stop there and just, just ask if anyone's got any questions about what I've done or what you want to do or what it takes to be successful in in a career in biotech, any, anything you want, I'm happy to talk about. Yeah. How did you get into biotech? Like, how did you know you were interested? I didn't, <laughs> right? Um, uh, so I got into it um, really through the business side. Like I said, most people in senior level, I was, I'm the chief executive of the company, or was until last week, um, have two or three of these degrees. I don't, I have an MBA from our business school, and I've got an undergraduate degree in physics, but it's not biology, it's not chemistry. So I got into it from the, from the business side, where um, uh, I, I first joined this company called Harvard Apparatus that became Harvard Bioscience. And that was, that was a, a buyout. Harvard Apparatus was a, uh, a troubled company. It was in decline, and uh, me and a colleague bought it uh, with venture capital backers. And we turned it around for about 10 million in sales, about 100 million in sales, uh, and took it public. So that was my introduction to uh, biotechnology, but it came from the business side. It did not come from the science or the, or the medicine. But then what happened is one of the, um, the, the tools that we were making, which are products that scientists use to do basic research, became very useful in this field called stem cells, very useful in the field called regenerative medicine. And it became such a big opportunity, we eventually separated into a separate company called BioStage and spun it off as a separate product company. So I got into it and I became, I became CEO of that, that spun off company. So it was kind of a circuitous route. I came in through the business side, most people don't. Most people come in through the science or the medical side and then um, start that way. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. 
What else? Yeah. Um, How does the FDA approval process like actually work? Um, it is very science based. Um, so the FDA requires you to to show that the product is safe and show that it is that it works. And that, that's the, the two things the FDA tries to trade off. If if it's a fatal condition, maybe it doesn't need to be quite as safe. But if you are the fourth drug to treat cholesterol, it's got to be really safe because there's three other drugs to treat cholesterol, okay? So the FDA balances the risk and the benefit to patients, but you have to prove with statistically valid clinical trials, which usually go in three phases. Usually there's phase one, which is where you test the drug for safety only. It's on healthy adult volunteers. These are not people with the disease. These are healthy people. You test it on those patients for safety only, not patients, those people, those volunteers, for safety only. Is this gonna cause some bad side effect? That's the first thing. If you pass that safety test, then you go to phase two clinical trials, which we have a small patient population of people with the disease. So it's a cancer drug. So the, the first phase one trial will be in healthy adult volunteers, not with cancer, just to see whether the drug is safe or not. The second group would be a small number, perhaps 100 patients with cancer. You're really measuring safety in the patient population, not safety in the healthy population, um, plus a little bit of efficacy. You, you see if there is an effect on the cancer. But only if you pass that second phase of clinical trial, you go to phase three, the last phase, where you do a very large number of patients which have the disease and usually you compare it to a control group. So, um, so patients who are diagnosed by a doctor have, let's say, let's, let's say it's I don't know, breast cancer. Um, they are randomized to either a treatment arm or a control arm. So the patient doesn't know, the doctor doesn't know which arm they're in. That's called double blind, so there's no bias from the patient to the doctors. So, so it's half the patients are treated, half the patients are not treated. And then after a follow-up period, let's say a year, you statistically analyze all the data and say, was there a measurable effect of benefit to the patient compared to the risk? So that process can take 10 years because you have to go through each phase of the, of the process. And you can fail at any, any phase. Does that answer your question? Anything else? Yeah. Um, are you involved in the process? Oh, actually, for your cl clinical trials, do you, or do the companies typically do it within their own kind of research facilities, or do you work with other um, facilities, hospitals, or any other facilities? So, so patients do not come to our facility. Right. Patients go to a doctor or a hospital. So in this case, because this is actually requires removal of the esophagus, this is going to be a major surgical uh, uh, intervention. So, so the, the the main hospital that's doing our clinical trial is Mayo Clinic in uh, New York, New York City, and then there are two other hospitals. One is MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas, and one is the University of Michigan. And they all have a lot of esophageal cancer patients. They're sort of well known for for treating um, for treating this type of cancer. So they're the ones who find the patients. And then they decide, okay, we're gonna treat this. We have, we have no role in deciding which patients can get treated because that would be a conflict of interest. So the doctors make the decision on their own and they have hospital ethics committees that make sure there's no compromise of anything with the patient. Patient safety is the top priority. And if all those tests are passed, then that surgeon at Mayo Clinic will do the surgery, take out the disease esophagus, implant our product, take the, take the biopsy, send it to us, we make the cells. Um, so we do the making of the scaffold, we do the making of the bioreactor that it sits in when it's incubated. Um, the cellularization is actually done at a um, FDA approved clinical cell culture lab, which is actually at the University of Texas. Uh, and there's like a dozen of these around the country, which was set up by the FDA specifically to get human cell therapies in the trials. Um, because that, that facility costs 10 to 15 million dollars. So we really couldn't afford that on our own. So we, we rent their facility. It. So we make the scaffold in the bioreactor, the cellularization is done at the University of Texas Medical Branch, and the, and the cellularized scaffold is shipped back to Mayo Clinic, and the surgeon does the, the work there. So we don't do any of the patient work at our facility. Our facility is in Holliston, and um, we have labs, uh, scientific research labs, and <coughs> manufacturing, so we can make that under sterile conditions. But, but that's where we stop, and then everything else is done at the hospital. Yeah? How long does the uh, process to like, ship it? Hospitals uh, typically take? Someone literally gets on the plane with a, a cooler box under their arm and uh, takes the horse with it. So, that's like basically what the it is. whole process? Like the whole process is about four weeks. Four from weeks, from okay. the patient arriving at the hospital, having the biopsy, 
they ship us the cells, ship, ship the cells to the University of Texas Medical Branch. They do the expansion and the seeding, that takes a couple of weeks, um, and then it's shipped back to, uh, to Mayo Clinic for research. Yeah. So the stage one, it's usually people that like aren't sick or whatever, and right. you should test it off. Would like with the whole like trachea thing, would it be like someone who doesn't have anything wrong with their trachea having an infect, like getting on the like, so, so what I described, that phase one, phase two, phase three process is typically what's done for either biotech drugs or for chemical medicines, okay? You have to establish safety first, then efficacy. It would be completely unethical to go around taking out healthy people's tracheas and putting in new ones or stuff like this just to check safety. So the FDA is smart. They say, okay, for your product, our product, BioStage, um, there's no way to test safety on its own. So what they, what they do insist is we do tons of animal research. So we have done, we've done this surgery on 50 pigs. Most, most biotech companies go into clinical trials having done about 10 large animal surgeries or injections or whatever it is. So we've done an enormous amount of large animal research to satisfy the FDA because you cannot test safety in humans. It's gonna be unethical to do that. And because we're using cells from the patient, there's no risk of immune rejection. If we're using cells from a different source, there would be a risk of immune rejection. So that would have more safety issues, but because we're using cells from the patient, there's very little risk to the patient. Uh, only, if our, only if our manufacturing process gets contaminated or something, would there be a risk to the patient. We have so many checks on contamination during the process, it, the likelihood of happening is, is near zero. Uh, and because our scaffold is removed, you may have heard of things like hernia meshes, which are implantable scaffolds that people use to um, um, uh, repair hernia damage in the body. Um, they've caused untold problems because the scaffold becomes incorporated into the body, you can't get it out. You have to surgically remove it. Our scaffold is removed. If that scaffold is permanent, the FDA have much bigger concerns about safety. Because as soon as there's plastic in the body, it's gonna move, it's gonna erode a blood vessel, it's gonna cause bleeding. It's a, a real hassle to have long-term plastic inserts in the body. Um, so the fact that we remove it for about 90 days and it sells from the patient dramatically lowers the safety risk to the patient. And therefore the FDA is not making us do any kind of safety only test on humans. We're going to be treating patients with esophageal cancer right from the start because that's the only ethical way to do the current trial. Anything else? I thought there's one in the back. No? no? Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure talking. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. If you are interested in biotech or something and you want to just talk about it, please contact me. Uh, I know Liz Friedman has an email address. It's davidlcgreen at gmail.com, davidlcgreen at gmail.com if you want to contact me. All right. Thank you. Thank you.